Hey everybody. Today I'm going to do a pretty much a pretty thorough review of the optical and the radar sights found in the B36 Peacemaker. I'm going to explain the basic operation and describe every sight in detail. So I guess we should start with the nose of the aircraft. If you look at a B-36 popping out of the nose of the very center of it, just off to the right-hand side, you'll see a very small dome. And that dome is the optical head of one of these guys here that weigh about 110 pounds per unit. And they're called the Hemisphere Siding Station. If we look at this guy right here, you can get a pretty good look at the uh, optical head that I just described that pokes out of the front of the airplane. I'm given to understand that before the aircraft was allowed to taxi, they had to move that protective aluminum dome because the optical head cost the taxpayer $65,000 per unit. I've actually looked at old records and these entire units in 1952 cost $265,000 per unit. Um, the B-36 program was significantly changed as well as significantly stalled in terms of the armament procurement because of the hemisphere siding station in that it became too complex for the subcontractors to build or specifically it was too hard for General Electric to build so they had to eventually outsource it to Eastman Kodak. Once you got your, your optical head, it's dual prism. It's got a prism here which reflects down a tube to here where there's another big prism. The prisms are radioactive. They do contain thorium. So there is that concern. This is what, if you look on the B36 on the inside, you'll see that very familiar ring dead in center. And that's what that's for. These tubes are for an internal dehumidifier and stuff, there's a fan in, in there. On the optical head, there's a big heat ring for defrosting this as well. Um, every hemisphere siding station had a static dehumidifier and had a active dehumidifier, which channeled the air via a pump. They're actually called desiccators. So that's a static desiccator and a active desiccator. This was for aligning the site with the turret on the ground. These are your one speed and 31 speed Selsun generators. These are essentially generators which produce a voltage between one and 31. Uh, imagine that the turret was on a clock that went from one to 31. If you turn your siding station to 13, the turret would eventually end up at 13. Inside here you've got spare bulbs, lots of spare bulbs and spare fuses to be found on the B-36. This is incomplete, it's missing a few parts. Uh, number one, it's missing the apparatus which rested here so you could put your right eye or your dominant eye, your left one, whichever, and the other one was like a cup that uh, blinded the other eye. Here's your data plate. Nomenclature for this unit is a 2CSH6E1. This is all optically adjustable by turning this. On every siding station, which is, these are all known as siding stations, you turn this dial and you were expected, or the gunner was expected to know the wingspan of all the fighters that he was pursuing or targeting. So you would turn this and inside here, it would light up and you would have your, your rings that would expand and contract, which told the computer relatively how far away the target was. This is your gun camera. All the siding stations had gun cameras at one time. Some of the later models omitted them. This is your control. Um, I'm perplexed as to how 
you were expected to shoot down potentially a, an ME-109 or an ME-262 traveling at 400 miles an hour coming towards you, you know, the B-36 traveling at 300, combine that with the 400 of the fighter, you're tracking, you know, by looking in here and turning this very clumsy and, and tight, because mind you, this has to turn the selsums and it has to turn the optical head and the prisms up there. So it takes, it takes about 15 pounds of pressure to turn this. So once again, you're, you're talking about a blink of an eye, an incoming fighter going essentially Mach 1. I'd like to see that happen. These are the later model sighting stations for the, um, the C system. The C system had gyroscopes on them, which I'll get into a little bit later. Or I'm sorry, the C system had dual gyroscopes. The earlier B system had a gyroscope that was uncaged, meaning it could produce signals for both azimuth and elevation, whereas the later model equipment in the C system had um, caged gyros. So you had one gyro for elevation and one gyro for azimuth. So this was an earlier model siding station. This one was actually made by Farron Optical, who designed it and then sold the patent to General Electric, and then Eastman Kodak built them. So this is a very early model. Not only does it have a Farron Optical data plate, but you can tell it's early because it has this right here. Now what this does is up under here, there would have been a big, probably spun metal, spun aluminum drum that would have held a gyroscope. That would have been uncaged, so it would have had azimuth and elevation. I'm gonna go up here to this other model sighting station to show you what I'm talking about. So here's your gyroscopes. So you can move the scope in both azimuth and of course, elevation. And these gyroscopes, they, they give you leads. So the movement of the gyroscope produces a voltage, which goes to the computer, which goes to the thyrotron controller, which I'm not gonna get into, which then told the tour exactly where to turn based on your lead. But in the early model hemisphere sites, you actually had one of these gyroscopes mounted down there. So if you go back to what I was talking about, the, the amount of force it takes to move this contraption, add the gyroscope that was initially mounted here. Now that was all well and good in the B model system for the uncaged unit, but in the C model, they couldn't figure out where to put it. So what they did is they eliminated the gyro altogether and right behind the hemisphere, they had this guy here. This is called a gyro drive unit. Use his data plate. This one is configured for the tail. This